Hi everyone, welcome to Mutual Exchange Radio, a project of the Center for Sales Society. I'm your host, Corey Massimino, and today I'm gladly joined by Elizabeth Nolan Brown. Elizabeth is a senior editor at Reason Magazine, a co-founder of Feminist for Liberty, and a journalism lecturer at the University of Cincinnati. Welcome to the show. Hi, happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you on. So I always like to start by letting our uh, listeners kind of get a sense of where you're coming from and your background. So I was curious if you could talk about maybe some of your influences, you know, authors, journalists, books, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I got into libertarianism through, I'm a total, like, I guess, beltway libertarian. Cause, uh, I, I didn't get in through, you know, re- reading great philosophers or economic texts or anything like that. I didn't get in through, uh, Ron Paul, like a lot of people around my age, I, I got in by, I went to an IHS sem- Institute for Humane Studies seminar, and uh, they gave us a subscription to Reason Magazine and books by like various authors who happened to work at Reason or at the Cato Institute and things like that. So that was really my, uh, when I learned what libertarianism was. And it was kind of one of those things where it was like, oh, I actually like have been a libertarian for a long time. You know, I just didn't know that this was a thing or, or I've been a classical liberal for a long time. I just didn't know that this was a thing. So that sort of started me on my journey there. I did end up then, you know, eventually reading more of the, of the philosophical underpinnings of it. But, um, that was, yeah, I, I was, I was the same. I, I, when I discovered, uh, the ideas of libertarianism and the term libertarian, I felt like, oh, I kind of already had this yeah. kind of idea, this worldview, and that there wasn't a name for it. I'm, I'm curious, did you, did you always intend to go into journalism then? And then you found, and you kind of became, you know, a conscious libertarian or, or was it some other way? Yeah, I was, um, well, so I was actually, I was a theater major in undergrad. I was a playwriting major and I wanted to do uh, playwriting and directing, but then I was like, you know, there's, there's no way to make money from this. So like, I'll do that on the side, but, but I'll do my day job as journalism, which was something I'd like done in high school and like done, you know, just freelance in, in college. So it was something I was always interested in, but uh, I ended up getting a job at a newspaper and I, I worked there for like a year. And then I was like, man, journalists don't get paid anything. I'm going to, I'm going to become like a, and this was what, when I went to the IHS seminar and I like went to DC and I discovered that there were these things called think tanks. And I was like, what? This is nuts. There's like things where people just get paid to sit around and, and think and talk and write. <laughs> I was like, I want to do that. And I want to do like PR or like marketing for one of them. So I, I went to DC and I went to grad school actually in strategic communication and uh, after doing that, I was like, I don't want to do this at all, actually. I just want to go back <laughs> to journalism. So um, th- that was my sort of, yeah, securitist okay. road out there. Uh, how, do you, how do you kind of balance or navigate the demands of journalism with, you know, not just working for, for a reason and ideological, a pretty explicitly ideological organization, but also just yourself having, you know, some ideological commitments of your own as a person? How do you kind of navigate that? Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm really just really happy to be able to write for reason, because they're very much committed to letting us sort of, uh, you know, to, to, to we do we do unbiased journalism in, in a way, you know, I mean, we're not, we do reporting, everything is very research based, it is very documented where things are coming from, if it's, you know, studies or statistics, and we interview people, we do all the, the those traditional journalism things, but also, you know, we don't, hide where we're coming from we tell you then like here are the facts and here's what we think about it and here's what we think you should think about it too you know um so i i it's really important to me to be able to work at a place like that i don't think i'd be i mean i have done straight news stuff before but um you know i don't i don't think i'd be very happy just you know having to just report on things and not sort of give a take or at least not sort of like report on them and like you know that's the terrible like old model where it's like here's what like someone says like the sun is yellow and like someone else says the sun is blue and you have to like report both of those as if they're equal. And like, I'm, I'm glad that I don't have to operate in that model. Yeah. Yeah. I, ideology is kind of a dirty word, but, but I don't think it should be. I mean, we all have ideologies. So I kind of appreciate that acknowledging it, you know, or leaning into to that while still doing journalism, but you're not pretending you you're neutral yourself or somehow free of ideology. Um, I, I wanted to ask about feminists for Liberty. So when did you co-found that and what what was your kind of goal, I guess, or your kind of intent with starting that kind of organization with that name? Yeah, so uh, Kat Murdy and I uh, co-founded it in um, 2016, actually. So we've been around a while, but we've sort of been like, I mean, the first few years, but we didn't incorporate until 2018. 
And so we sort of, uh, and we're still sort of figuring out what, what we're doing. Um, our goal though, I mean, we've known all along what our goal is, right? Our goal is to sort of, uh, counteract two, two, uh, prevailing notions that we think are wrong, which is one that like, um, you know, libertarians can't be feminists. We think in fact that like feminism is inherent to libertarianism, at least, you know, feminism as we understand it, like a belief in the equal, you know, agency of, of women and of, of people of all genders. Uh, but, also to counteract the idea that like all all feminists have to be left wing. I mean, there's like a really long history of, of individualist feminism or classical liberal feminism or whatever you want to call it, libertarian feminism, um, you know, going back centuries. And that's sort of been forgotten in recent years and recent decades. And uh, I mean, even as much as close as the 90s, there were a lot more like people out there calling themselves libertarian feminists and sort of advocating for this sort of feminist tradition. But that's sort of like, went away. So our, our idea was just to be like, hey, we want to, you know, um, be out there showing that this ideological space exists, highlighting historical and text in this realm, and also new writers who are doing this stuff, and just sort of, you know, putting it out there, getting getting libertarian feminist ideas into uh, the discourse, and um, and just sort of How? sort of conventional, you know, uh, notions about what feminism is and does. How is your do you think in so what's that six years now how's your reception been do you think among on the one hand libertarians but also feminists i guess <laughs> feminists is just like non-existent like that there's just been like and i mean i will say it because kat and i are steeped professionally in the world of libertarianism maybe it's our, our our outreach has been much more in that realm than like trying to do outreach to um you know maybe other feminist groups or organizations uh, we did a little bit. We were in like the festival, International Festival of Consent, which was a, a more left feminist, li- liberal or left feminist thing. Um, but we haven't really done much and, and people and just have not really paid much attention to us in, in that sphere either. Um, in the libertarian world, though, we've had, I think, a lot more, a lot more opposition, but also a lot more like uh, success, too. Um, we've been, you know, we've, we've done panels and stuff we've invited to do stuff at like uh the freedom fest and um new and free state project stuff and various organizations so i mean like organizationally people have been really into it um it's also just been really cool like we just had a lot of young mostly young women some women of all ages just come to us and be like you know i thought that libertarianism was a space hostile to women because of because of various things because they got involved in you know, a Facebook group that was just full of like misogynists or whatever, or because their campus chapter of Young Americans for Liberty was super, um, you know, sexist or various things. They just been like, I I was, you know, I thought I was libertarian, but then I encountered some specific group of libertarians. And I, you know, thought that maybe this isn't the place for me. And now I found you guys' group. And I think that like, it's just, you know, it made me rethink and maybe think there is space for me in this movement. So that's been like the coolest thing to hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, you kind of preempted one of my questions earlier with uh, with how you got into libertarianism, but I wanted to ask the same thing about feminism. Was that before or after? Was that similar? Tell us about that. Yeah, I actually, I, I don't really remember exactly. Um, again, I also know that I like, I didn't, in, in, when I was in high school, I remember being like, I'm not a feminist, like feminist, you know, the stupid stereotypes, like feminists hate like traditional femininity and they hate women doing like, you know, um, just some typical things and stuff. And, uh, but it's, you know, I, I, as I got older, as I got into college and got into my twenties, I, I read more feminist texts, texts and realized that, you know, that's, that's the myth about feminists. And obviously there are some feminists out there that like that, but there's, you know, a wide variety of feminisms. And for the most part, the kind that, that I, you know, identify with is, well, sometimes derogatively called choice feminism. But um, I, I think it's weird that that's supposed to be like, uh, pejorative, but you know, it's just, it's <laughs> like, you know, we want women to have equal access to things. We want women to be treated equally under the law. We want women to be treated equally and, you know, by pol- in politics, but like whatever women decide to do is fine. Like we're not, you know, it's not a feminism that says like women have to do, have to do this or this women have to, you know, work and not have, or women have to not have kids. Women can't wear makeup. I mean, these are trivial things, but you know, these actually have been like, especially when I was growing up in the nineties, like big debates within the feminist sphere, like can feminists actually like embrace, you know, stereotypical femininity and still be feminist was, was, you know, sort of a a big thing for a while. Um, But yeah, so I've, 
you know, I came around and I started really, I think actually, so now I'm, now I'm, as I'm answering, I'm kind of remembering more too. Um, a big part of it was actually reading feminist blogs too, because, uh, like in the early OOs, um, because there was just like a lot of, you know, pre-social media, there was a lot of feminist blogging out there. And a lot of them were, um, you know, uh, like Democrats and, and people that I didn't necessarily agree with on everything, but the way that they sort of presented feminist issues around consent and around um, just just a lot of things like that made me made me into it. And then also I've always been um, following like sex worker rights movements has been a thing that like since I was a teenager, I was following too. And so I guess that's, you know, another form of feminism that I've, that I've always been interested in. So what is the main, or maybe, maybe it's a couple of things, but what do you think is the most important thing that libertarians uh, can can learn from 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 feminists? Um, I mean, I think that that feminists like there's a lot of good feminist writing about about consent and about women's agency, and I think that these are important. Um, you know, we like to say that, like, Effortless for Liberty, one of our things we always say is, like, libertarianism is consent culture, or, you know, libertarianism preaches consent in all things. So, um, I mean, maybe actually I'm, I'm answering the opposite question, what, what feminists can learn from libertarians. But, um, you know, because feminists do talk a lot, uh, mainstream feminists do talk a lot about sexual consent, but then they don't apply that same sort of rubric to, to many other areas of life, and, and we would like them to do that. Yeah, no, that was my next question to ask you the reverse, of course, um, so it seems like there could be some mutual learning. Yeah, I mean, it's hard um, to answer the first question because, again, like, while I think that classical liberalism, I think, you know, it, it's, it, yes, it, it respects the equality of all people. So, like, yes, like, classical liberals are feminists. But um, when you talk about like libertarian politics, like not like the philosophy behind it or something, you know, I mean, it is just it is essentially concerned with keeping the state out of people's business. And so it does allow for pluralism. So I hate to say that, like, you can't be a libertarian if you're a sexist. Like you can actually, as long as you're not going to put those ideas into law and, and try to like enforce them through the government. So. Well, I kind of wanted to ask about about some of that as well, about libertarian ideas versus the libertarian movement because it feels like maybe you have different opinions about each and it feels like there's a disconnect um at least some aspects so can you speak to that uh i mean i i, I think that yes they complement each other but they're they're not obviously the same thing it's it's different if we're talking about a libertarian politics like specifically concerned with you know with, with electoral politics or, um, you know, influencing public policy, or if we're talking about the philosophy of libertarianism, which is something, something more broad in some ways and more narrow in some ways. Um, mm. I've never really been involved with, with the libertarian party until like two years ago. And I, I started getting involved and then uh, it's taken a very disappointing turn recently. So my mm. involvement might be sort of short lived. Mm. Understood. Uh, so, um, what about the, the feminist movement versus feminist ideas? Do you see any similarity there or any disconnect there or any way that the movement and feminism, uh, can, can, can maybe be closer to the ideas or? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's hard because when we talk about, you know, there's not a feminist movement, like one, you know, like there are mm -hmm. all sorts of different schools of feminist thought and, and action. So like, if you look at sort of the history of feminist activism in the US, like it's been a constant push and pull between different schools of feminism that have actually sort of, you know, radically different ideas of what, how we should put feminist, I guess, ideas into practice. And like, you know, the only thing they share is like an idea that like, you know, women should be treated equally as men, but like, there's always been a fight between, you know, classical liberal feminists who think like, you know, we need to set the conditions of equality and then, and then, you know, let people exercise their individual choice and in what they do with that versus, you know, um, more left feminists who are like, we need to like use the state to, you know, uh, ensure equal outcomes for women. And, you know, um, that's always been sort of a back and forth. There's always been like a back and forth over how much the state should be involved in, in achieving feminist aims. And especially when it comes to police, I mean, that's been such a huge thing since, you know, what we think of as, as the first wave of feminists in the 1800s going up till today, there's like huge divides within different feminist communities over whether or not like, you know, passing laws and then having police enforce them is the best way to stop 
things like violence against women or, or just any sort of, you know, feminist problems. Yeah. I've appreciated your writings on, on, on kind of an anti-carceral feminism. Um, uh, I like those articles. Um, Thank you. Seem, seems like a good uh, counterbalance to, to, yeah, fem- feminist ideas then kind of inadvertently morphing into supporting some sort of police state or, or that kind of worldview. Um, yeah. And there's like, I mean, you know, like American black feminists, like historically have been all, all about the anti-carcel feminist, uh, you know, agenda. And, and they've been, you know, very much in the 20th century, just like fighting against this sort of a uh, mainstream white, like largely white, you know, feminism that was the one that got the most attention. And, you know, it's not surprising because it was the branch of feminism that was like, Hey, like, let's, yes, like, let's do everything that, um, you know, powerful people in government want, like, let's give the cops more money. And, um, I just think that's been, that's been a huge mistake. Mm. Uh, you got, you kind of, uh, mentioned sex work earlier. I, I, I like to discuss that a little bit. Um, cause I've read a lot of your writings on, on sex work on the war on sex. Um, and, and I find it all kind of depressing, I guess. It must be depressing to follow this beat on the news, especially as of late. Um, but I, I did want to ask what, what do you see on the horizon with that? Because, I mean, at, on the one hand, it seems like crackdowns are, are, are on, on, um, you know, through, through bank accounts or through police or through all, through stigma kind of escalating. But at the same time, it feels like your kind of writings, people writing maybe similar things related to you, that kind of, um, you know, uh, defense of sex workers is also maybe on the rise. So how, what do you see the future of, of the war on sex work? How they're playing out? Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's, there's some reason for hope after like about two decades of just straight up, like constant increasing attacks on sex workers under the guise of stopping sex trafficking. I think people have started to come around a, a very small group of people, right? Like it's, it's still like if you ask your average person, I think they think that there's like this wild sex trafficking epidemic in America and that, you know, um, having police arrest consenting sex workers is somehow vital to it or having them crack down on online porn is somehow vital to it. But I do think that that there has been growing awareness of the of the sort of um, moral panic or manufactured scope of some of the, the sex trafficking um stuff in in popular culture. And I think, like you said, yeah, like there's a lot more people writing about it. When I first started writing about this issue for a reason in 2014, I don't feel like there was maybe a small handful of people, two or three other people that I think were kind of uh, writing about this. And now there's, there's, I can't even name like all the people. There's at least a few, you know, dozen writers who are sort of uh, poking holes in, in the the sex trafficking, you know, myth. And, but when I say the sex trafficking myth, I'm, you know, talking about this idea that there's just like, hundreds of thousands of people being sex trafficked in the United States and that it's rising and that it's by organized cartels. And, you know, most of the time when, when sort of exploitation or force is being used, it's by one or two people. And it looks much more like an abusive boyfriend or an abusive family or something like that, rather than this movie version of like people being, you know, chained to radiators and, and needing police like SWAT teams to bust them. It's more like we need, you know, Anyways, but so I think there's a lot more people writing about it. And I also think that the sex worker rights movement has just been incredible and um, had some really good, good successes at at least getting legislatures in, in cities across the country to start introducing um, bills to either decriminalize prostitution or to do other things like at least, you know, like carve out things where sex workers can report crimes against them without fear of being arrested. I mean, that seems like such an obvious thing that I can't believe that that's been a struggle, but it has been. Um but I mean, yes, there are there are small signs of progress, at least. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Um, uh, uh, I guess that leads nicely into something else um, that I had on my list of things to discuss, which is you you write so much about, like you said, moral panics, and 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 you're often, I feel like, trying to be that voice of reason. Uh, pun not intended, but. Uh, um, yeah, and, 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 and kind of at the same time, you know, uh, halting calls for increased government violence, um, and intervention into, to supposedly solve these moral panics. Um, so, and like you said, since 2014, you've been writing about, so that's almost a, a decade. What do you think 
makes these certain these narratives so appealing and so popular is it just the sensationalism like you said it's like a big move it's like a big hollywood movie for people to to kind of watch or is it maybe anything deeper or 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 varied yeah uh that's sorry it just reminded me like i was at a conference this past weekend and someone asked what i wrote about and i was like well you know like i'm big on moral panics they're like like spreading them i was like no 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 like debunking, <laughs> debunking them i'm not a my group is not spreading moral panics um my colleague at reason jesse walker writes a lot about this um he's written a book about conspiracy theories and i think that he's got some good ideas which is that like i mean the the particulars of the myths and moral panics we see that get really big in america change but they often sort of have the same underlying structure or even the same underlying sort of uh narratives you know like like this idea that like some sort of shadowy global elite is like abusing children which we see now through like QAnon and stuff is really just a sort of rehash of these sort of um 1980s panic around like supposed satanist cabals that were in league with hollywood and with you know musicians and you know if you go back throughout history you, you see like various versions of the same panics like over and over again um I think that they like take on new forms or like new particulars based on what anxiety is anxieties are at the moment. Um, like, you know, I've, I just was talking about the sex trafficking panic. We've had sort of, especially coming up since, you know, around 2000 or maybe even starting in the nineties. And um, it, it happened sort of almost a century after the first big sex trafficking panic in the United States. Um, and, you know, at that time, it was really connected to, like, the urbanization of America and people moving to cities and a lot of, like, um, young women being on their own, like, you know, like, 20-something women, like, actually working and living outside of their family's home before they were married and, and you know, um, also, like, new transportation, so people traveling out on trains and things like that. There were all these sort of, like, urbanization and industrialization fears that and, – and also um, racial fears, too, obviously, because we had more immigration happening. We had a lot of people, like, um, freed slaves that were, like, moving north and into the cities and, you know, mixing with whites. So you had just, like – all these different fears that sort of led to this panic, which they actually would call it, it was, you know, very racialized back then. They called it the, the white slave panic, which was this idea that men and particularly like black and brown men were, were snatching up young white women to, to sell them into slavery. Um, and I think that, you know, when you, when you flash forward a hundred years and, and think why we had um, this panic again, I think a lot of it has to do with technology because so much of the fears around this, like these days are caught up in the internet. So I think you can look at, yeah, like a lot of like social social and technological changes are always sort of underlying these moral panics. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. I didn't know a lot of that. Um, the connection makes sense between urbanization, industrialization and kind of these, you know, city life is, yeah. you know, it can be chaotic and new and, and very anonymous. Uh, very a lot of people that don't know each other. There's a, there's a really fascinating book called Policing Sexuality. Um, and it's, it's all yeah. about sort of the roots of that and how, and how that led to the, one thing I don't think a lot of people know is people think that the FBI really started spreading across the country because of prohibition, but it actually happened um, like about a decade before that, where federal agents started being put into offices all around the country because they were worried about trafficking of young women. And that was really mm. sort of how the FBI got its, got its roots was in this moral panic around, around the game. Hmm. 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 Yeah. I can't help you be reminded of, um, it feels like the perfect illustration of this like cultural mo moment, this like intersection of these multiple moral panics, like you said, about surrounding race, surrounding women, surrounding urbanization it comes in um, the film, the birth of a nation uh, helped revitalize the, the KKK kind of with this narrative, right. Of, of, of a woman um, being victimized by, by a black man and portraying the KKK as heroes. Um, kind of startling to think how popular something like that was, but it seems like perfectly illustrative of exactly the moment that you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, and like, you know, we see during the, the Trump administration trying to do that same sort of thing with constantly harping about how, you know, people were coming over the border from Mexico yeah. and, and Latin America countries. And they were, you know, he talked about sex trafficking being a big problem because these people were coming over right. and really sort of, you know, right. playing to these, to these racialized fears about it still today. Hmm. You, you mentioned uh, QAnon and kind of these conspiracies about cabals. So I find conspiracies really interesting. Um, I have an interesting history with them. I have close 
family members who are very into conspiracies. Um, and I myself was more into conspiracies when I was very young because of that. Um, but I'm more and more interested in kind of the psychology and sociology of conspiracy theories. And especially now is that at least it feels like they're more popular, or more appealing. Um, at least it feels like that. I'm not sure the data always backs that up, uh, actually. Um, but it definitely feels like in the mainstream discourse, conspiracies are playing a big role. And I guess I wanted to ask, I want to, that a certain, I feel like there's gradients to, to what, like what, uh, conspiracies kind of get out there and kind of get popular kind of degrees in their, uh, comprehensiveness or complexity or the narrative they're telling. Um, but I definitely see something similar or at least softer forms of what you said, these QAnon type conspiracies, those seem very appealing to people who often have libertarian instincts, anarchist beliefs, anti-authoritarian people. Um, it feels like they're quite attracted to these, these ideas. So I wanted to, I guess, steel man, give the best case maybe for, uh, for that. And I wanted to see what you thought and, and kind of tell me why I should not go down that okay. rabbit hole because, because <clears throat> so on the one hand, you know, I think, and we've talked about before, but I think, you know, in many ways we live in a, in a society that has a rape culture. Um, I th also think we live in a society that marginalizes and discounts children and kind of disbelieves children. I think we live under a criminal justice system that privileges the uh, rich people, connected people more, you know, far over poor. Um, and I think institutions of power and hierarchy are corrupting. They're evil. They they oppress us, you know. So if I put all that together, it doesn't seem like I'm far from some very unsavory and some outlandish conspiracies that have become dominating the discourse. So what do you, what do you think of that? What do you say to people who, who seem to just be on the verge of that moral panic you're concerned about? Yeah. I mean, first, I just want to say that, like, you're right. Like, I feel like a lot of libertarians and people in, in that sort of realm are, are giving us this reasons. And it's not unreasonable on one hand, because a lot of the things that we know are actually happening, like people would accuse us of saying are conspiracies, like things that we because it's just like, people don't want to believe that there is so much corruption in our government and in our law enforcement. And it, and yeah, I mean, things that, that like, I'll, I'll tell people things and they're like, what? Like, and then if you look it up, like there's, it's documented, but it just seems like there's so many things that the, you know, that the government has done and still does that I wish for conspiracies and are true. So it, yeah, I, I just, just very quickly wanted to say just recently was taught, was having a conversation with, with some very smart and well-read folks and, and they, but they asked me, did, you know, did the FBI actually try to have Martin Luther King Jr. Try, commit suicide? And I was like, well, yeah, 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 that's, I'm not, I'm not into conspiracies, but if you're asking me, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's so many examples like that. So it's, yeah. So I don't think it's totally unreasonable that like people buy into a lot of, a lot of these conspiracy theories. Um, I mean, the, the circumstances you mentioned though, I mean, I'll just say like, there is, there is no evidence that there is this, there's just no evidence that there is this widespread, you know, sex trafficking of, of children being done by people in our government or by the elite. I know people always point to Jeffrey Epstein and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not denying that that like happened. Right. But like, we know about that case. I'm not saying that there are no cases of things like this happening, but like there is no evidence that this is widespread and that is not for a lack of just tons and tons of attention and money and groups in the private sector and the nonprofit sector and, uh, you know, and, and politics, like all trying to, to help in this realm. So I think, you know, you have to say that there would be some evidence of this, of this happening. I mean, if, if it was, um, I think that it's important to say that like, this doesn't mean that there's not bad stuff out there and that people don't need our help. Right. And that's, that's why, yeah, yeah. this is what I always want to make sure people know is the bottom line. Like, I'm not just like, ha ha, people are dumb for believing in this. And that's why I want to debunk it. Like I want to debunk this because, because two things, like one, it gives cover to the government to do a lot more bad things. If they can just invoke these, you know, alleged hundreds of thousands of children who are being sex trafficked, no one asks questions when they want to do like new surveillance powers, when they want to do new laws that, you know, require censorship on the internet mostly when they went to go and arrest people, um, you know, arrest sex workers, arrest their clients, or just do general dragnets. I mean, for like 
over a decade, they've done this thing called Operation Cross Country, where it's essentially just like a big vice squad thing. And they do a lot of prostitution arrests, but also like arrests for like driving without a license or like, you know, having a firearm without the proper license or various things like that, or, or drug possession is a big one. And they'll arrest all these people. And then they'll be like, hundreds of people arrested in a sex trafficking sting. And people think like, oh my gosh, they arrested hundreds of sex traffickers. And then it's like, no, they arrested hundreds of people on petty charges in their sex trafficking sting. And then, you know, that's how they can sort of get away with it. So, you know, it gives people, yeah, it gives them cover to do a lot of bad things that we wouldn't otherwise, you know, appreciate them doing. But um, also, you know, it takes away from the problem of actually helping people who do need it, including helping children who are being, you know, abused or sexually exploited or anything like that, or women who are, you know, in abusive relationships. Because like, I'm the we should be helping these people, but it doesn't, you know, it's not going to happen. Like I said before, with like SWAT teams going in with cops doing stings on them with cops arresting and sending sex workers, you know, like we need, we need people to, well, to decriminalize some of this stuff so that these people actually can come forward against, you know, about crimes against them or people in their communities. We need like either private charity or social services that can, that can help people who are in these worst, you know, conditions. Um, we need like a reimagining of our foster care system, whereas a lot of these problems come from, and we need to stop thinking of, of abuse as something that's coming from these like shadowy international villains or, or these Mexicans crossing our border as, you know, Trump might say, and something that's happening actually, unfortunately, like within families and within communities, just, you know, that, that are everywhere and around us. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right that there's not, there's not much more to say than, well, there's no evidence. I I really, I mean, that's one thing I really appreciate about some of your, your research, uh, as being, you know, some of my go-to articles, because I encounter some people, so many people who, who find this kind of story compelling. And as we said, that's understandable on some level, because in broad strokes, you can paint this picture that's appealing to a libertarian or anarchist view. And it seems to confirm everything about what we, you know, all right, the systems of power and, and abuse. Um, and then, and then, yeah, when you actually look at, at the details or what evidence we have, it's, it suggests not the case. Um, so it's, yeah, one thing I really appreciate about your stuff, it just become go to kind of articles to send people like, cause I'm, there's not much else, you know, it's not like I'm disagreeing with the view that the government is bad or does bad stuff. Like you said, it's just, um, I guess kind of related to that and kind of kind of going off of how maybe understandable some of this stuff is you write so much about, like you said, moral panics, but uh, is there anything we should be morally panicked about? I mean, we're libertarians, right? Should we be morally panicked about the government? Is there, or is it like a specific kind of thing that just is always counterproductive and bad or. Oh, I mean, there's, I think what do you think? lots of things that more people should, yeah, be morally panicked about, uh, <laughs> but Somehow, yeah, they're not the same ones that I get the most attention. Um, you know, I wish people would be more more aware. Uh, like, you know, one that's kind of people think of the conspiracy, but how much of like people get mad at like tech companies, right? Like, oh, big tech is constantly censoring people and doing all this stuff, banning this kind of speech and that kind of speech on this thing. Um, you know, people would get mad a few uh, years ago all the time at colleges for the way they were conducting um, investigations into sexual assault or that seemed, or even just like, bad speech on campus that they, you know, that they'd investigate any speech about like sex or offensive concepts. Um, you know, sex workers are often complaining, rightfully so, that like banks and payment processors are are arbitrarily seemingly canceling their accounts because they're deemed to be, you know, risky businesses. And um, like all of this stuff is true that this was happening in a bad ways with tech companies and banks and then colleges and all this stuff in ways that are like, uh, but it's not just happening, happening in a vacuum. Like, this is what I wish people would understand more across the board that like, it is not like the CEO of these, you know, uh, social media companies are just like, Oh, I want to ban this kind of, I want to ban like this kind of speech, this kind of speech. I want to be a speech police. It's not like these banks are like, I just want to like ferret out sex workers and cancel their accounts. Like it is being done at under so much pressure from the government, both explicit and implicit. I mean, you have these sort of like arcane regulatory rules that kind of require, um, people to do this sort of thing. You have um, politicians sort of threatening even worse regulation. If they don't, you just have like, you had Operation Choke Point, this big thing under the Obama era where they were pressuring payment processors to get rid of, um, you know, anybody involved in adult activity, adult, adult businesses, but also like gun and ammunition manufacturers, sellers, like 
there's just so much pressure behind the scenes that the government is doing in order to get private actors to do their bidding without having to actually sort of like literally force them to, because if they did this out in the open, there'd be a lot more revolt. And this way they get to just be like, no, you know, like Twitter just decided to ban this sort of content or ban these accounts when really it's, you know, under such extreme pressure from the government. That's, that's one of my hobby horse, uh, not conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you see as, um, what, what do sex workers do to try to, you know, uh, you know, fight against this route right around these kind of restrictions or this kind of ties into some, you know, discussions around maybe the use of things like cryptocurrency yeah. or these anonymous payment systems. So what do you think about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's lots of ways. Sex workers are always sort of on the cutting edge of, of technology um, because they, they have to be, because they have to stay one step ahead of things, which is, you know, unfortunate because, like, you can imagine a world in which, like, a lot of our of our technologies and things like this could could really help make sex. I mean, it is helping make sex work safer as is. But you could ha- imagine a way where, like, if this was allowed to be more formal, like if people could just use this to do sex work out in the open, like there could be so many apps and innovations that could actually make the sex workers' lives a lot easier and safer. That would be just you know much much bigger than they are instead of them having to sort of figure out how to use existing technologies in ways that would benefit them. Like there could be dedicated things for that. Um, I, I will say though that, you know, sex workers will often complain that like people are always like, just, you know, crypto, just use crypto and like crypto is good. Crypto is very important and I'm all for it. And I think it's important for, for all sorts of reasons, including for people in the sex industries, but like, it's not, it's not the, the solution to their problems, right? Like, uh, I interviewed someone, uh, a porn star named Ali Awesome about this reason, uh, and she's like, you know, like, I can't pay my landlord with crypto. I can't buy my groceries with crypto. Also, mm-hmm. crypto has to go through exchanges. And um, and it also has to, you know, if you want to withdraw, you have to put it into a bank eventually. And, like, they are very unfriendly. Like, some exchanges are starting to be unfriendly to sex workers because, again, because they've got so much pressure uh, because the government says, like, oh, we're worried about sex trafficking. So, you know, just, like, don't do business with anybody who's in the adult business. And so you see this sort of these same prejudices like happening now in the crypto sphere as, as we're happening with traditional banking. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, so uh, very limited in your view or, you know, maybe useful countermeasure, but it's not any sort of solution. And it's, and and even there it even has these weaknesses. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, maybe kind of shift a little bit, maybe to a kind of lighter topic. Okay. What do you think of abortion? (laughs) Oh, good. Yes. Much, much more fun topic. Uh, I mean, I am, I am pro-choice. I yeah. am upset about many of the things that are, that are happening right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, How? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, obviously I think that these, that a lot of these abortion bans are bad because they are going to, you know, make it illegal for people to get abortions and that's bad in and of itself. But again, like, I think that there's a lot of larger concerns around this too. That, and that's one of the things I've been actually trying to do with my writing on this at Reason is, is sort of focus on like all the ways that this would be bad for expanding government and for civil liberties and things like that in a larger sphere. Um, you know, we're already starting to see like all these like attempts to crack down on free speech under the ga- uh, guise of, you know, stopping people from getting information about abortion. Um, before Roe v. Wade, there was like a lot more of those. I wrote about a bunch of these cases where just like all sorts of speech, like even just like counseling people about how they could get up a state to get an abortion or, you know, newspaper articles about that, like have been implicated. Um, also, you know, just if you're going to stop people from getting mail order abortion drugs and, and doing it at home, you know, we're not talking about having to go to a clinic all the time anymore. So it seems like we're going to have to like massively expand like the drug war in order to, if we're going to have a war on abortion drugs, we're going to have to expand surveillance of people online. There's just, there's a lot of like larger concerns too. Uh, you've been around libertarians for a long time. How many nowadays do you think share your view, um, more or less on abortion? Um, I have no idea. I know that there are more sort of openly pro-life or anti-abortion libertarians now than there have been in the past, but I still think that there's, that there's a huge, you know, proportion of, of libertarians that that are pro-choice. And I also know that it's not like the strict dichotomy people think it is often. Like uh, my, you know, my Feminist for Liberty co-leader, uh, Kat Murdy, she describes herself as 
as pro-life, but she doesn't want the government to, you know, stop it. Like I, I have a lot of colleagues like this, or several colleagues like this at Reason too, you know, it's the idea that they, and I know that nobody's like, yeah, abortion is awesome. So it's a little bit weird because it's like, well, what do you mean when you say you're personally pro-life? Like nobody's like, woo, abortion. But I think it means like that they really, really, really think it's a moral imperative that this not happen at all, right? Whereas I'm like, I would say that under certain circumstances, it's, it, it's you know, fine. And I'm not, not worried about it morally. Um, but so, you know, but, but a lot of people will say like, I personally would like to see an end, a total end to abortion, but like, we're not going to get there through prohibition because we haven't gotten there through prohibition in any other realm. So it's more about like, you know, advancing understandings or changing hearts and minds and that sort of thing as opposed to law. So I think that there's like a, a totally legit, you know, space there for people to be libertarians and have these pro-life views and not have them be at conflict. Yeah. On, well, yeah, I, on some level, I really respect and I can appreciate that view that is kind of eschewing the traditional dichotomy. I see it also amongst you know, uh, Christians who, who become pacifists and are really strong into kind of pacifist Christianity. And, and so then they have that simultaneous commitment to, uh, pro-life, but also a complete opposition to using, like we were talking about earlier, earlier, using carceral means or using the state and using police to, to, to achieve, to achieve that goal. Cause that's also against the principles of anti-violence. Um, <clears throat> But at the same time, I, I have no reservations too. That it's, it's, it, it kind of brings up interesting questions of what does it even mean to be pro abortion? Yeah. Is, is anyone that in a certain sense or so, so do I have it right? Like you think that there are more probably pro life libertarians now, but perhaps still a majority would be closer to acknowledging the kind of in between, but maybe a spectrum closer to the pro. Yes. I mean, that, that's in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious, but I mean, yeah, I have my own experience. I, I think I can like share. Actually, say or anything. Yeah, I don't know. I've seen some polls and some data, but it feels all very. I, it never feels like it's a big enough sample or anything. But I kind of share your experience. Um, why? Why do you think so many libertarians don't, you know, go full on your view, uh, pro choice? What are they mis- missing? Uh, I mean, it's again, like I understand why some people are are not right like i mean it's not a thing that it's it's very much like metaphysical questions involved about when does life begin and you know like what what is you know when does does a soul exist like when does you know uh lots of religious beliefs tied up in this like i've talked a lot of this about with my my colleague stephanie slade who's you know um you know very much an advocate of of pro-life libertarianism and you know we've We've talked about how libertarianism does not answer the question of whether abortion is right or wrong, right? Like you have other beliefs, like other moral beliefs, religious beliefs, things like that, that answer the question of whether it's right or wrong. Libertarianism might have something to say about what we should do about it and, you know, how well prohibition or not would work and things like that. But I don't think, I don't think that libertarianism can answer the question of, you know, if, if you think libertarian, if, if you think abortion is, is morally right or wrong or under which circumstance it is it is because i mean most people aren't like you know i don't think most people the polls do show not of libertarians but of of people in general that like most people aren't like it's always right or it's always wrong like most people Mm -hmm. have various limits and and you know about what it should be okay and what it isn't okay um so I guess to move on from, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about abortion a little bit with you because we've been wanting to talk about abortion on this podcast because of the recent news, but it's, what is, it's not much there to talk about. It's kind of like, yeah, did you hear the news? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, yeah. yeah it's absurd. But, uh, but I didn't want to ignore it either. I wanted to kind of bring it up and maybe pick your, pick your brain a little bit about it. Um, well, I have, I, maybe to go back a little bit though, um, in, in our last maybe 15 or so minutes here, um, about feminism and libertarianism, because I think that's such an interesting space and it's such a, you know, try, I, 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 you know, uh, find your attempt at synthesizing them so appealing, obviously. But, um, but where do you think if, you know, are there are areas in which feminism rightly understood, according to your view, and libertarianism rightly understood, where they nevertheless conflict or have tensions and, and maybe can't be reconciled in some way? Maybe one has to give way to the other or? Or do you kind of see them always as? No, I mean, again, because I think, like I said, like there's, there's various kinds of feminism. So obviously some kinds are just totally intention 
Wait. Yeah, but your but your feminism and like your like rightly understood according like I don't think no I don't think that there are okay. necessarily any type okay. of, there's nothing where I think that they're just very complementary and sort of totally flow from one another um, because both you know both libertarianism and and the sort of classical liberal feminism are about respecting you know individuals as individuals and you know individual rights treating yeah. people equally under the law and and that's if that's the basis of both then i i don't see how they could be in tension with, with everything like you mentioned going on with the libertarian party and, and the rest of, of libertarianism as a movement are you more optimistic or more pessimistic maybe about the viability of that synthesis like going forward like uh i mean i am very much more pessimistic about the option like within the libertarian party but also who knows you yeah. know who knows how this will all shake out. Um, but we've never, you know, been that invested in a libertarian party. I just, so I, I think that it doesn't really affect yeah, the project as a whole. And I think that overall people like libertarians are, are very interested in the idea of sort of reinvigorating a libertarian feminism. Cause like I said, like, I mean, there's this group, the association of libertarian feminists that was around and, and very much actually affiliated with the libertarian party. Um, from the seventies through the nineties and it still exists, but it's doesn't really do anything anymore at all. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I think of us as trying to just sort of revive that, revive that tradition, which has always been there and which I think people have always been very receptive to. We're trying, we're always trying to figure out that that is really like, what is the best way to do this? It's, it's very hard to know. Like, do we, do we try to do, do we do panels? Do we like hold like, <laughs> You know, like, are we trying to do research? Are we trying to do working groups? It's it's hard to know how to best get these. Yeah, I obviously feel that with with C4SS is obviously kind of coming at it from a similar angle with a lot of different audiences that that kind of can be hostile to each other. So who are you talking to at any given time? How do you how do you kind of talk in two separate languages almost at the same time? It's and then it makes both sides hate you. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, there was a sex worker rights group. Uh, I won't say which one, but I was talking to them uh, and they were showing me their different flyers that they have for like going to like left conferences and going to libertarian conferences and how they, and it's not like there's anything wrong with this, but it's just funny to see, I and mean, it's actually smart, but to see how they frame the argument for decriminalizing prostitution when it comes to talking to libertarians versus when it comes to talking to people on the left. Oh, that's, that's pretty interesting. Actually. I didn't, that's, that's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so that, is- for the left, it was all about like, you know, racial justice and gender justice and helping, you know, marginalized people. And the thing for the libertarians was all about like, you know, um, individual rights and your rights to, you know, economic privacy and you know, bodily autonomy and things like that. So not letting the government wow, yeah. tell you what to do. You sure you're not talking about C4SS? It's so similar to the kind of, kind of, I feel like line of thought that, that, that I've had too. And, and, when you're talking to someone, if, if the audience on your panel is left wing or libertarian, we're pretty we're pretty much to the hour mark. We can we can wrap it up. Um, I, I've gone through most of my questions. Okay. Uh, can uh, this has been a lot of fun? Can you just tell our our listeners maybe where they can they can read you, where they can reach you? Yeah, um, you can read me at reason.com. You can find me on my most active social media is Twitter at e n as in Nolan Brown. Um, and also you can find Feminist for Liberty at feministforliberty.com and we've got all of our social media things on there. Great. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Elizabeth. I really appreciate it. I've had such a fun discussion. I hope our listeners have enjoyed it. Um, look out for next uh, month's episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. Take care.